Hey, welcome back to the Adult Bible Study of First Baptist Church of Ray City. My name is Pastor Charles, and it is a pleasure and privilege to dive into the Word of God with you on a weekly basis. And this week, we're diving into Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8 through 15, looking at what Solomon has to say about following the path of righteousness rather than the path of wickedness, which leads to destruction. We're continuing this series in from the Explore the Bible material of Lifeway, and I hope you enjoy the study today from Proverbs 14, verses 8 through 15. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8 and verse 15. The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his way, but the stupidity of fools deceives them. The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. This lesson is going to be slightly different than normal. Normally, I work straight through a passage of Scripture to the end. However, Solomon wrote this section in a chiasm, or in a chiastic structure, meaning it is set up in an A, B, C, D, D, B, C, A pattern. So verse 8 pairs with verse 15. Verse 9 pairs with verse 14. Verse 10 pairs with verse 13. And verse 11 pairs with verse 12. This poetic style of writing in Hebrew is done to aid memory. When reading this style, it functions similar to a wave or climbing and descending a mountain. In the middle is the peak or the main point and is the truth that the writer is trying to get across. We will see this more as we dive into this section. These two verses create a chiastic pair. This means they express similar, if not the same, words or ideas, but usually in reverse order. This is clearly seen in these two verses. Notice how the sensible person is, appears in the first line, while the sensible one appears in the last line, linking these two thoughts Together, The thought of both of these lines is that wisdom of the sensible one or sensible person is to consider their ways by carefully watching their steps. The word sensible in these two verses can also be translated prudent or clever. This points to a person who takes time thinking through a situation and coming up with a realistic course of action. Therefore, they have wisdom because they use their knowledge appropriately. And because they use their knowledge appropriately, they examine their lives and therefore consider their ways or lifestyle. The phrase, to watch his steps, is another way to say the same thing. This is contrasted in both verses with fools or those who are inexperienced. Verse 8 tells us these fools are deceived by their own stupidity. This line could mean the stupidity. Their stupidity is evident in the deceit they practice on others. However, based on the context, it appears to me they are deceived by their stupidity is the correct understanding of this line. The word translated stupidity means fool, foolish, or folly. And combined with the, with the description of the person as a Fool gives us the understanding of an individual who is incapable of making rational, moral decisions. Verse 15 looks back in time for this foolish person who believes anything or everything as it can also be translated. We know this looks back in time because a fool does not consider their way as verse 8 alludes to. Therefore, an inexperienced one is someone who is naive and will believe anything and everything. The contrast here is that the wise person thinks through their life and decisions, 
while the fool is gullible and falls into his own foolish vices. Verse 9 and 14. Fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the righteous. The disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves and a good one what his deeds deserve. These verses do not have the usual reverse order of a normal chiastic pair, yet they still function as a chiastic pair because of their parallel ideas. The phrase, making reparation, means to make amends for sin in accordance with the guilt offering of the sacrificial system. Leviticus 5, 14 through 6, 7 and 7, Leviticus 7, 1 through 10. The thing that distinguishes the guilt offering from other sacrificial offerings is the need for restitution, whether with man or with God. The reparation payment was in addition to the guilt offering that was given at the tabernacle or the temple. Thus, we can see from this verse, fools mock, scoff, or scorn the idea of giving any of their wealth for a wrong they've done. In their selfishness and self-delusion, fools hate the very idea of reparation. Often believing themselves above the law or rejecting the law altogether. We should see this link to the first line of verse 14, the disloyal one, literally the one whose heart turns back will get what his conduct deserves. This would be the fool of verse 9, who abandoned through his his mocking his commitment to the covenant of Israel. The Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Therefore, we have all been either the disloyal one or the fool. We often choose, like the disloyal or the fool, to worship false gods in our lives, assuming we can sin without consequence to ourselves. What we must see is that apart from the mercy of God, we will get what our conduct deserves. However, there is one who is a good one, or more accurately, the good one. Jesus received what he did not deserve, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 and Luke 23:41 He was pierced for our sins and crushed for our guilt as the thief on the cross next to Jesus proclaimed this man has done nothing wrong Jesus died that he would become the payment for our sins Romans 3:24 through 25 The goodwill or acceptance as the ESV translation says among the upright is only through faith in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6, that we may come to the Father and become upright. We must be unified to Christ, and this is only done through faith, Galatians 3, 26. This is not from ourselves. It is God's gift or goodwill because we could do nothing to earn it, Ephesians 2, 8. This is how we receive good will acceptance or favor. Solomon might not have fully known or understood that it would be Jesus of Nazareth that would come into the world to be the Savior who would pay the price for our sin debt, but he did know that in eternity everyone would get what their conduct deserves. And those who are upright, meaning found in Christ through faith, will find goodwill and receive what Jesus, the good one, and what his deeds deserve. Proverbs 14, 10, and 13. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. Even in laughter, a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. God alone can completely know the heart of another person, and this chiastic pair deals with this truth. The heart which is understood in Hebrew thought to mean the place where thinking and decision-making is located, knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. Everyone is alone 
in their truest feelings. These are individual and private feelings with each of our souls. No one, no matter how close, can fully understand someone else's deepest feelings. Whether deep bitterness or jubilant joy, as people, we often mask our true emotions. This is why verse 13 says, Even in laughter a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. Our outer appearance may say we we are happy and joyful, when in reality our heart is heavy with grief or sadness. This is often how we go through life, never telling anyone how we really feel or the deep sorrow that we really carry. This facade cannot last forever. Just a moment ago I said we are alone in the deepest depths of our heart, and that is true in a humanly sense. However, God knows what someone's heart truly holds. 1 Kings 8, 39. And we can find comfort in the Lord, who is our mighty counselor and our prince of peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Though people cannot fully know our hearts, the Lord has placed godly men and women in our lives to encourage, lament, edify, and walk diligently alongside of us. And we are called to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Romans 12, 15. We should strive to journey with others through their joys and their sorrows, all the while remembering that the author of their life is the one who fully understands. Our ministry to others should always be a ministry of pointing them to Jesus. And Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of this at Lazarus' tomb, John 11, 33 through 38. Although he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he shows us what it means to weep with those who weep. Proverbs 14, 11 through 12. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. This pair is the main point and the central truth of our section today. The truth is choosing the way of wickedness will ultimately end in destruction and death. House and tent in verse 11 both refer to the same thing, one's possessions or members of one's family. These two lines are telling alternate realities of those who follow God and those who don't follow God. Those who follow God will flourish, while those who do not follow God will be destroyed. It is interesting to note the difference between house and tent also. For the house refers to a more permanent structure, while a tent refers to a movable shelter. The point we should see in these two words is even the sturdiest lives lived in wickedness will be destroyed. Adversely, even a life that looks more vulnerable and less permanent, when placed on the solid rock of Christ, will flourish. The word flourish is a gardening term that describes sprouting and budding of plants. The ultimate picture is one of growth, prosperity, and stability. Those that are found upright through Christ place their lives on the solid rock of Christ rather than on the shifting sand of their own opinions. In verse 8 and 15, the image of the fool is one of naivety and deceiving themselves by their own stupidity. This image ultimately leads to verse 12. Here we see a man standing on a road or a way that appears to them to be right, which can also mean straight or level. This seeming rightness is based on their own human evaluation, yet its end is death. Without leaning in on the wisdom of God, our lives will end in death. However, when we place our lives in the hands of the God of mercy, we will find that even when life feels like it is falling apart and the world is crashing down around us, we can rejoice. We rejoice because God knows our hearts 
We rejoice because, because God has made a way where there was no way. We rejoice because Christ died for our sins and is calling us into his family where death will not hold us down. We rejoice because when we trust him, we are found in him. And when we are found in him, we get what he deserves. And our joy will no longer end in grief, but will live on for eternity as we rejoice in the God of our salvation. Following God's wisdom leads to joy, while failing to do so leads to the grief of destruction and death. Welcome to the question and answer time. My name is Summer and I am Pastor Charles's wife. Um, today I was excited to talk through, well I'm always, I'm always excited to talk through the question and answer time, but I was really excited because I kind of wanted to talk about a lot of things, but for sake of mm -hmm. time, we could only tackle one. Um, I just wanted your thoughts. You talked about it some. I would love to go deeper into how should we view ourselves mm -hmm. um, in light of Scripture. You know, Psalms and Proverbs, I would love to read it and say, I'm the wise one. I'm the sensible one. I'm the one that makes good decisions. Mm -hmm. But I also know I'm in the sinful flesh and... My desires are being made new by Christ. I'm, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. I struggle. Um, how should we rightly view ourselves in the context of Scripture? Well, I think that, like you said, I tried to cover some of that in the study. Um, but I, I want to say that Proverbs, Solomon starts the entire book of Proverbs with what he knows and understands as true knowledge. And that is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the foundation of knowledge and wisdom. And what we have to understand is that we must fear the Lord. Now, what does fear the Lord mean for us? Well, to fear the Lord for us means for us to submit ourselves to the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible is a triune God, a God three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which the Son came and died for us on the cross and is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we are able to come in to communion with God. We're, it's only through our trust and it's only in Christ that we find contentment, we find joy, we find peace, we find hope, and it's only in Christ. And so to, to get back to the, the section of Scripture that we are in, we have to see in light of all of Scripture, in light of all of the Bible, Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, we must see that we are people, meaning as Solomon says in First Kings, as David says, as Jeremiah says, as Paul says, as Jesus says, no one is good but God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Mm -hmm. We have to see that about ourselves. Now, as I said in the Bible study, the way that we become upright, though, is in Christ. Mm -hmm. And through faith in Christ is how we, is how we become upright. Mm -hmm. It's by faith alone in Christ alone, that we are able to have and become what Proverbs mm -hmm. and Psalms talks about. That, that's how we become upright is in, in Christ because now we are found in Christ. And so when God looks at us, what he sees is he sees Christ on top. He sees Christ and he no longer sees the sinfulness of Charles, but he sees Christ and what Christ has done and the love that Christ has poured out. And from there, I, through faith in him, try to become more like him. And therefore, I am now 
upright and I, I'm now wise and I'm now able to do what the Bible has called me to do, not because of my own strength, but because of the strength that is in me through the Holy Spirit, the strength that is in me through my faith in Christ, mm -hmm. the strength that is in me because now I have a, a right understanding of who God is because I have a right understanding of who Jesus is. Yeah. And he, over time, I mean, the process of sanctification becoming more like him, mm -hmm. over time, our desires are changing to be like his. All of our, you know, even what you talked about really early on, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Mm -hmm. Lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. How, are, how is our path straight? How do we make the right choice? How do we go down the right path? Mm -hmm. By trusting in him, having that relationship with him. Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. Most definitely. Sorry, I stole your word. <laughs> <laughs> we are so glad that you joined us for today's adult Bible study, and we will see you again next week.